Uh, welcome uh, to the panel uh, on authoritarianism in the European Union. Um, today, um, the values that make up the European Union are in danger of being replaced by an emphasis on identity, uh, it seems. And this is an identity that openly challenges the worldview of the 68th generation. Uh, in a speech he gave in July uh, 2018, uh, Prime Minister of Hungary, Viktor Orban, uh, called on his supporters to wave goodbye not only to liberal democracy, but the entire elite of 68, as he put it. Orban has been referred as Trump before Trump by uh, Steve Bannon, Trump's former chief strategist, uh, who has his own political agenda and works through a foundation called the Movement uh, in order to unite the new right and create a new right majority in the European Parliament in May 2019. Uh, Nick Burns was referring to this also in the earlier uh, panel. In a joint press conference in 2016, uh, Viktor Orban and the leader of Poland's Law and Justice Party, uh, Jaroslav Kaczynski, both used the expression stealing horses together in the stable of EU, uh, apparently an expression of mutual trust, after which uh, the Reuters had the headline, Polish-Hungarian Horse Thief Alliance Alarms Brussels. <laughs> that was the headline. So it is with this alarm <laughs> that I would like to open this panel on authoritarianism in the European Union and introduce our panelists. Uh, Sigurd Ekier uh, is a professor of government at Harvard. You all know him, uh, our host and director of the Center for European Studies. Uh, John Shattuck is Professor of Practice uh, in Diplomacy at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. Um, he formerly served as the President and Rector of Central European University uh, in Budapest and also served as Assistant Secretary of State for Democracy, Human Rights and Labor under President Clinton. He was also the US Ambassador to the Czech Republic. Um, Boniko Mukawei is a politician, lawyer, and former prosecutor from Romania. She's currently a member of the European Parliament from the European Conservatives and Reformists, and formerly a member of the Romanian Democratic Liberal Party. She was the former Minister of Justice of Romania. Um, last June, uh, I attended uh, you know, a conference in solidarity with, uh, you know, Central European University in uh, Budapest in order to empower Central European University at that particular moment. It was on academic freedom, global challenges, and I saw uh, firsthand the impressive struggle Michael Ignatieff, current president and rector of uh, Central European University, was waging in defense of academic freedom. Michael Ignatiev could not be with us today, but he sent uh, a video, uh, and so we're gonna watch that, and then we're gonna go uh, ahead uh, with our speakers, who will each have uh, 15 minutes, uh, and after which, uh, you know, we're gonna have a discussion, so. Colleagues and friends, I'd, I'd like to be there today, but uh, the situation in Hungary just makes it impossible. But you do have Monica Makove with you, and she's an alumna and a trustee of CU, so she can uh, explain the whole story in person. Since March 2017, CU has been fighting to remain in Budapest because it's been our home here for 25 years. We're proud of lots of things, that we welcome students from more than 100 countries, that we have faculty from 40, that we're among the most competitive institutions in Europe in terms of getting competitive research funding. But we're proudest of all of our fight to defend academic freedom and institutional autonomy in Europe. We fought for some very simple principles, that universities should be free from outside political meddling, and that they're entitled to a stable rule of law framework for their operations. 
Universities can't operate if their legal framework is at the whim of the government. In other words, if law is a simple tool of power. In Hungary, law is a tool of power. The legislation which will forbid us to accept new students after January 1, 2019, that's in 56 days, was passed without consultation in the parliament, without discussion with us. We have no legal right of appeal, even though the law is in flagrant violation of the Hungarian constitution. We have no effective remedy in European law, even though the legislation violates treaty law on the freedom to operate services in education. Now, the European Commission has launched infringement proceedings with the European Court of Justice, and the CEU case figured prominently in recent days when uh, the uh, European Parliament voted to sanction Hungary. But none of these actions have had any effect, and our experience is a sobering demonstration of the weakness of European institutions in the face of clear violations of the rule of law and academic freedom in member states. So that's the European dimension, but we're also an American institution. And thus far, the Orban government has failed to respond to repeated attempts by the US ambassador to persuade the Hungarians to allow an American institution to remain in Budapest. So that's where we are. Now there are two lessons here, and the first is that single party states in Europe can defy European rules and values while continuing to enjoy all the privileges and all the resources that go with European membership. And the second lesson, even more depressing, is that US allies and NATO partners can defy the United States without any consequence. And there's a third, final, and wider implication. US universities have campuses all over the world, in Abu Dhabi, in Singapore, in Shanghai, in Beijing, and CEU's story is a warning to all of them. In a decade, will those universities still be able to operate as free institutions? To ask this question is to ask a question not just about the future of academic freedom, it's to ask a question about the future of freedom itself. Thank you. So Michael, um, I think, outlined in perfect way the challenges uh, which we face uh, in Europe. Um, and I think that the, the issue for that panel goes to what Daniela described as a future uh, in the next couple of years, where we can really see quite amazing disunion uh, and a situation within the European Union when decisions can be blocked by countries which are not happy uh, with, uh, uh, with the policies of the Union. Now, um, we, I'm going to talk briefly about two countries. Um, for the first time in the history of European Union, uh, we have uh, two countries, two member states, which were formally charged uh, with assault on the rule of law. And we have two countries which breached the fundamental European values. And those countries uh, are very unexpected uh, actors to do that. Uh, they are the most successful countries uh, of the post-communist space in terms of reforms uh, they introduced over uh, almost three decades. Uh, these are countries which contributed to the democratization of Eastern Europe uh, in the 1980s and 1970s. And these are the countries where majorities of population remember the communist rule. Uh, this is not an idea that you know, grandparents are talking about, uh, uh, but, but this is really for people of my generation and a couple of other generations down the line, uh, this is the real life uh, experience. Uh, now, the whole thing is puzzling uh, because at the same time, uh, those countries achieved tremendous economic success. 
So Poland, as a, one of the very few countries over the last two decades, was just moved uh, to a rank of developed economy, joining the 25 other developed economies in the world. Uh, so this is not an economic story which is behind the rise of populism and authoritarianism in Central Europe. Uh, this is not also the story about immigration. Uh, those two countries are really uh, the countries which do not have the uh, refugee problems. Poland last year had 40, four zero applications for asylum from Syrians, right? So this is not something which fuels populism in, uh, in other countries. So the big question is really uh, what explains the rise of illiberal democracy in this region, uh, the Euroscepticism, and, uh, and why this happened in the most successful uh, countries, uh, the new members of the, of the European Union. Now, I will talk about uh, 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 two things briefly. First of all, I want to um, make argue that this is a part of broader pattern. This is not only about those two countries, but really about the whole post-communist uh, uh, region. Uh, and then I will try to overview a little bit, you know, I, I don't want to make this too academic really, but, uh, uh, but talk about the existing explanations and how should we think about, uh, about that. Uh, so let me briefly uh, uh, start uh, by uh, saying a few things about the retreat from liberal values across the region. Now, this all started not two years ago, not eight years ago when Orban became the prime minister of Hungary, but much, much earlier. Uh, since 2004, the year in which those countries entered the European Union, uh, we see the constant process of declining uh, quality of democratic institutions. Uh, we see the process of uh, really uh, declining economic reforms. And this is visible on this map that over the period of 10 years, uh, the countries are really uh, showing declines uh, uh, here in, uh, in the quality of democracy. And among those countries, uh, the two, uh, this is Poland and Hungary, so the all uh, countries are really declining. The scores of all the countries are declining, but the scores of Poland and, and, and Hungary are declining uh, very fast. <laughs> Uh, now, those two countries have a dubious uh, 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 distinction to be among the largest decline in uh, quality of democracy in, uh, in 2016. And Poland, of course, uh, has the uh, uh, privilege of being the top country with the decline of freedom of press uh, in 2016. Uh, so when we look at the map of Europe today and we ask the question, where are the populists in power or in coalition government? They are exactly uh, in this part of Europe. These are exactly in uh, those countries. Uh, uh, and uh, of course, the big question is why this has happened. Now, before I, I turn to the question, let me, let me briefly uh, uh, outline what the situation looks like in those two uh, countries. Uh, so, Hungary today uh, is not a democracy. It's not, it is not liberal democracy. It is not democracy. Uh, Hungary today uh, has a system of government where you can predict with 100% certainty who is going to win the next election. Uh, so we can say that Hungary is a hybrid regime. Hungary is not a tyranny in the sense, you know, of tyrannical governments we know from, uh, from the past, but this is not a democratic society. Now, Hungary needs EU, uh, and, and the leadership of Hungary has been playing quite pragmatic game over the last uh, uh, 10 years or so. So when pushed uh, by the European partners, uh, Urban tends to step back. Uh, but we have seen in the recent weeks and months that that position uh, is not really uh, uh, you know, sustainable anymore, that he becomes much more confrontational uh, with, uh, with uh, the European partners. Now, Hungary is what Valid Major, the great Hungarian sociologist, called the mafia state. 
Now, there is an oligarchy, economic oligarchy in Hungary uh, uh, with very close relations to Hungarian government, and that oligarchy was really built on the funds given to Hungary by EU to build infrastructure and other projects and so on. Uh, so it's a, it's a paradox. It is not Russia where the oligarchs emerged by accident in the chaos of transition. In Hungary, the oligarchs were created from the top by the Hungarian governments. And the last thing which is important about Hungary is that Hungarian opposition is in disarray. Uh, this, is a, this is a very uh, uh, sad story when you say uh, that the biggest opposition party with the biggest support uh, is the party which is to the right of Fidesz, right? These are the real fascists. Uh, now, what is even more troubling in case of Hungary uh, is that that party called the Oblix, uh, the brown one here on that bar, uh, is supported mostly by young people. Right. So the question is why the generations in Hungary, in this uh, case, which have the highest opportunities any generation ever had in Central Europe, are turning away from democracy and supporting uh, fascist parties. Uh, now, two more things about Hungary. Uh, it's a absolutely open use of anti-Semitism. Uh, George Soros is a uh, boogeyman, uh, and uh, and entire Budapest was plastered with this sort of posters uh, uh, during the elections. Uh, and of course, uh, this party is very much uh, anti-European, and that's the Jobbik demonstration uh, uh, several years ago. Now, so what about Poland? Uh, Poland is very different than, uh, than Hungary. Uh, it's different in that sense that, that uh, Polish authoritarianism is in a hurry. Uh, the Polish government does not have uh, advantage of uh, Hungarian uh, government having constitutional majority, being able to change constitution at whim. Uh, so Poland moves by violating uh, constitution, by violating uh, existing laws and parliamentary procedures. Uh, Poland also uh, is characterized by very fundamentalistic uh, thinking. Uh, they are not stepping back from any confrontation. Uh, they are not really listening uh, to anything uh, coming from Europe. Now, opposition is totally demonized in Poland. I, I just quoted the, uh, the, the words of Jaroslav Kaczynski uh, uttered from you know, the pulpit in the Polish parliament. He looked at the opposition members uh, and said that you are thieves and scumbags and, and murderers and so on. So, so opposition is, uh, uh, is really demonized. And we have the emergence of alternative historical bloc. I'm using Gramsci uh, term here uh, because we have this curious alliance emerging between the chauvinist nationalists, the Polish Catholic uh, Church, and extreme right organizations of, uh, of different sorts. And of course, Poland has this loony uh, policy uh, of building uh, alliance in Central Europe, both against EU, against Brussels, and, uh, and against Russia. Uh, this is a, a national demonstration uh, which takes place uh, uh, every year um, uh, by extreme right-wing organizations. And this is something which uh, sort of uh, describes that new emerging uh, historical bloc. So here are the members of the Polish government, the guys in suits, uh, uh, with the an, an famous former minister of defense, Maciarewicz. This is, of course, the Polish uh, Episcopat. And above them uh, is the flag of intra-war fascist organization, right? So that's the, that's the perfect depiction of that, of that historical bloc. How much time do I have? OK, good. Um, now, how authoritarianism is being built in, in those two countries? Um, uh, I'm not going to go into details, but really what we see there uh, is uh, something which uh, uh, a Stalinist leader of Hungary called salami tactics. Uh, if you want to destroy democracy, you start slicing it by tiny slice 
all the time, one after another, one after another. So this is exactly what is going on in Hungary and Poland. Uh, democratic institutions are being sliced one after another, taken over one after another, and so on. And, and it started with the state administration, uh, then it moved to the judicial system, uh, the, the media, then state-owned enterprises, and so on. So this is the tactics which, uh, which clearly uh, uh, is a, a very Stalinist tactic uh, in, uh, uh, in its heart. Now, where those countries are today, uh, I'm using the idea of my two dear friends. Uh, to say when we see the danger of democ for democracy in a, in a given country, uh, four issues. The weak commitment to democratic rules, and this is clearly the case for uh, in both countries. Delegitimization of the opposition, and I mentioned that already. Tolerance of violence, and we see increasing number of assaults uh, taking place uh, in Poland and in Hungary, and attempts to restrict civil liberties uh, in uh, media. Uh, and those countries fit that test very well. So why are we surprised? Why we sort of scratch our heads and think, what the hell is going on uh, in those two quite successful uh, countries? And I think part of the problem is that we missed a couple of very crucial developments over the last 30 years. So first of all, we missed the cost of roundtable agreements. What happened in Eastern Europe, in those two countries in, uh, in, uh, in uh, 89, was the revolution without retribution, right? The signing the agreements, accepting the former functionaries of those regimes as the legitimate players uh, in political system was considered a great achievement uh, of that transition. But in, in, as a matter of fact, what we see today is the price we pay for it. Uh, another thing which was uh, not fully recognized by us was the question of rule of law, how important cleavage uh, uh, that was. Uh, let me just skip a couple of those uh, uh, points, but uh, emphasize two more. Uh, first of all, the dilemmas of EU accession. Uh, the problem for those countries uh, was that they simply had to accept all the rules of the game uh, in which they did not have part uh, in creating, right? So this, everything was given to them, was decided by someone else. And I, and I think that was a crucial dilemma of EU accession, which is played very skillfully by those politicians now. And then the last thing I would like to emphasize is the emergence of polarized civil society. Uh, we see in uh, Poland uh, millions of people belonging to organizations f around the Catholic uh, churches, around the right-wing uh, media, uh, number of people uh, involved in those organizations is higher than the number of people involved in all the other NGOs, the liberal uh, NGOs uh, uh, we, uh, uh, we see uh, in those countries as well. Uh, so how do we explain that? Uh, now, there are three standard explanations uh, uh, we can point to. So the first explanation is the rebellion of transition losers. Uh, this is a classic explanation uh, we use in, uh, in uh, thinking about Greece and thinking about Spain, where those who lost economically as a result of crisis or transition are rebelling against, against the rule. Now, this is not really the case for those two countries. Those two countries had amazing uh, economic success, and it would be very difficult to point to the losers of the transition. That doesn't mean that some people are worse off than they, than they were before, but this is not something which uh, uh, which is very persuasive. Uh, the second thing uh, uh, I would uh, uh, say is something which uh, I call the fake Europeanization. Uh, when we look at <coughs> results of referenda and first elections, uh, now we realize how little support there was for democracy and joining the European Union. Uh, when you look at Poland here, uh, the accession referendum, only 58% of, of uh, Poles voted in the accession referendum, and 77 voted for. So majority of Poles were really against uh, joining the EU. Uh, even worse, the constitutional referendum. Uh, the first democratic constitution uh, since the Second World War, 
and only 42% people of Poles bother to go uh, and vote, and only 50% over, slightly over 50% voted in favor of that constitution. So really there is something uh, going on which we missed that, that, that people in those two countries really don't like much uh, 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 democratic institutions. Uh, let me just briefly uh, uh, say two more sentences about those explanations and I can uh, expand uh, on this in the, in the discussion. Uh, so the third explanation is the classic uh, uh, Ron uh, Inglehart and, and uh, uh, Pippa Norris explanation about cultural backlash and of course there is enough uh, evidence in those two countries to, uh, to really uh, uh, show that. Uh, but the last thing I would like to uh, emphasize is that we all those explanations are really the demand side explanation. We are s searching for something in society uh, which makes those people vote for those parties. But what is going on in those two countries is really the counter-revolution from above. Uh, we have a very disciplined uh, small political parties which have been working for the last 20 years very hard, building organizational structures to be able to take over power uh, to be able to introduce those policies. Uh, and, and I think that's the missing element which does not show up uh, in many of the explanations uh, uh, we have. And I'm more than happy to expand that on that later on. Um, hello, everyone. I will not use slides, but I prefer speaking standing uh, to respect to you, and um, I do so. Uh, I have some corrections or some addition to make to your uh, presentation on uh, Hungary and Poland, and I will start by this. The, in the Czech Republic, about we keep forgetting, and we believe that it's a heaven, and it's not, uh, but it's not about an extremist party, it's about the Socialist Party uh, and the campaign, and he won the campaign with the help of the Russian propaganda and the thousands or hundreds of thousands of uh, emails coming from uh, different uh, um, anonymous, anonymous uh, uh, email accounts uh, uh, changed the population. Now, uh, the Czech Republic is the country of Václav Havel. And now for the second term, we have a president from the socialist uh, government who, before the elections, the second elections this year, stated that in uh, 1978, 68, when uh, the Russian uh, troops uh, entered the Czech Republic and the Prague, um, they, did, uh, to de they did so to defend the national security of the Czech Republic and the students went out in the square in the middle of Prague. They were uh, uh, threatening the national security and their enemy of the state. Now, after this statement, he was re-elected for the second time. Uh, so let's not subestimate the Russian propaganda, which is going everywhere in all these countries, because uh, it's easy to, to, to uh, take over countries economically, politically, uh, if they are weak by corruption, uh, by uh, and and uh, by uh, they have w weak institutions and they have such rulers as the example I gave you. Um, I'd like to add a few things about uh, myself uh, to the introduction. I know I jump from one subject to another, but the time is limited. Um, um, now, after being a prosecutor, which it seems everyone uh, remember because I don't know, it sounds uh, juicy. Um, I worked as a human rights lawyer for about uh, 15 uh, years uh, with the Council of Europe and also uh, taking cases to the European Court in Strasbourg, winning all of them, over 25, I think. Um, and um, I, uh, I was the head of the Romanian Helsinki Committee for Human Rights. I worked in Bosnia, in Sarajevo for three years. I worked in Kosovo immediately after the bombing of the OSCE. So I did a lot of... Uh, different things in my life, and also in Macedonia, so I know the Western Balkans. And then I became Minister of Justice without being a party member. 
just by an historical accident. It was pre-accession, but it was good because I knew no one from the politics, so uh, I could send the, I could show them the door if they wanted to say they shouldn't be investigated. So we have uh, a successful anti-corruption fight, ministers, members of parliament, uh, former prime ministers, and mi ministers in office, I mean, and the parliamentarians in office uh, in prison. And the perverse effect of the successful fight against corruption is that um, now we have the socialist uh, power, uh, uh, a ruling coalition, socialists and liberals, but liberals are also socialists, um, in power and they, ha in half a year, they changed the criminal code, criminal procedure code and many other legislation because they want to escape prison and to preserve their assets. Um, and also they make statements about going, uh, leaving the EU. Uh, now I will take uh, to what I think to what I prepared to, to present, what I thought to present today. I will go into details because I'm coming from the European Parliament. I'm a member of the European Parliament since 2009. And uh, I know from behind, from, from within. And uh, you know, in addition to what we discuss in committees and plenaries, we also have a lot of discussion uh, uh, behind the scene. Um, so uh, I will refer to some of these. So I'll explain more about this. Um, the main problem of the European Union right now is migration, dot, migration. Um, rule of law, values, uh, justice, they matter, but not like migration. They come behind mi migration. They come uh, on the second, on the third, on the fourth place, yes? Migration is the main problem which we have to face. Now, why are we here? to have this problem. Um, first of all, I, I would say the main one reason only, uh, a bad policy on migration. If you remember, we voted in the parliament um, and the Germany was very strong. Angela Merkel even came to the EPP group and she said, you have to vote this with a very rise, uh, uh, you know, she was very vocal. Um, we voted, um, Reallocation. Now, reallocation, for those who don't know, means binding quotas for each member state. So each member state has to take 700, 2,000, 5,000, 20,000 uh, migrants, because we had migrants coming in the camps in Italy and, uh, and uh, Greece. Um, now, the plan, basically, the, the package was more complex. Okay, these people are coming by boats or where, however they come, but usually by boats. Um, and uh, when they are in camps in Italy and Greece, we'll do security, criminal and medical checks. And then we'll do the reallocation to other member states. Now, the second part of the plan, security, criminal and uh, medical checks, uh, never happened. Because uh, some run away from the camps in hours, in minutes, some in days. No one was checked, and they all went to the Northern Europe. Uh, Romania is a transit country, for instance. We had about, I think the quota was between 600 and 700 people allocated, which is not a problem. But even these people did not come. Uh, we had about uh, 60 people altogether uh, who, who, who stayed for a few days and then they took off to the north. Uh, even so, the Romanians are uh, against foreigners, against migrants, because of the third point I want to make. Uh, which is the cause of this, yes? And the cause of this is populism and nationalism, which are the tools of extremism. We reach extremism not all of a sudden, but after we put the seed and we work on populism and nationalism. Uh, we don't want European Union to interfere and to tell us how many migrants to take. Uh, we don't want European Union to interfere with rule of law. Now Romanians started to say the same, like Hungary and Poland. And, um, Another way to do this, uh, uh, this, to solve this problem of the migrants, 
uh, was what the UK did, for instance, which is called resettlement, and Canada is doing well. Canada is uh, in a happy situation, having an ocean around the, the island or around the country. Um, real, uh, re resettlement means that you do the security criminal medical check on the camps, and then you decide whom you take to your country, and UK, who voted against the bind binding quota, he, they took about 60,000 euros, much more than the quota. Yes? Uh, so that's the idea. And now we thought about this because we decided to do resettlement, but still the socialists and the liberals who in the European Parliament are also socialists, um, or tower socialists, and they vote together most of the time. Uh, they all want resettlement but to do these checks, security, medical, and criminal, after people come to the to Europe, which means we go back to to the same situation in which people will not be checked and they will run away, and we don't know how many migrants or foreigners we have in in Europe. Um, not even uh, the missed children. We believe there are about ten thousand missing children. We need to find them. We need to find their families. We need to save them from trafficking of children and so on. Um, now, who took the advantage of all this, uh, and who fuel basically, yes? As I said, the extremist parties with the tools of populism and nationalism. And I would not exclude, as I said, the Russian propaganda aiming at um, uh, a weak uh, Europe. Um, now, an example, Orban, uh, which my colleagues uh, didn't uh, but it's, it's speaking a lot about this. Um, I think in 2015, uh, Orban uh, uh, erased the fence at the southern border of Hungary in order to stop migrants and foreigners. And the people were happy. The Europeans were not happy. The people in Hungary were happy. They, were, they felt defended. This Orban said, we defend you. I defend you. Well, against whom? That's the question, against whom? But people didn't think, against whom we are defended? Who is attacking us? No one is attacking us. But they don't, didn't think further. Um, so nationalism and populism, uh, manipulation uh, about foreigners and migrants um, harmed a lot of people. Uh, I wouldn't say all the Europeans but a lot of people, and uh, so this gave rise to the extremist uh, parties in Europe. Uh, can I have the, the air condition a little bit lower because I won't be able to finish. Um, and uh, I, have a, I have a September 2018 uh, chart from BBC on the nationalist and extremist parties in Europe. I will not tell you the, if you want uh, the questions, I can tell you the percentages. But um, we have um, nationalist and extremist parties uh, in Italy, Denmark, Finland, uh, Germany, Austria, Slovakia, Cyprus, France, uh, Netherlands. Um, and I'd like to, to give you some quotas um, from Salvini. Uh, who is the Prime Minister of Italy, um, and uh, also from uh, Matteo, from Salvini, who is the, sorry, the Minister of uh, uh, Interior, who said, little ethnic shops should be closed by nine o'clock. He also said, foreign-owned grocery shops have become meeting places from, for drunkard, the drunkards, pushers, hellraisers. Quote, there are people who drink beer and whiskey until 3 a.m. and relieve themselves on the doors and gates of the neighboring houses. On Roma people, the same Salvini said, I have asked for a census of the Roma community living in Italy. The irregular ones will be deported. However, we'll have to keep in Italy the Roma with Italian citizenship, unfortunately. Uh, now, in Germany, uh, the head of... Uh, uh, the German uh, alternative, uh, the, the alternative for German, um, they uh, said that the police, uh, the border police should uh, shoot uh, uh, at refugees uh, uh, at the moment they enter the country illegally. 
just a few examples. Now about Orban, you know a lot. And uh, again, I'm a member of trustees since 2007, so if you have questions on all the history of CEU, I'm uh, happy to answer. But I'd like to introduce you to some other things uh, uh, related to the topic. Um, we also we also have uh, uh, other cases since, uh, uh, as I said, since migration uh, uh, is a main issue in Europe and uh, all the leaders are discussed about migration. Rule of law, freedoms and values uh, are not uh, coming to the front. However, EP started to act against Poland and Hungary uh, on Article 7, which means uh, uh, suspending some uh, some rights, but this is a long process and I don't believe it will ever end. But they are not excluded from the European Parliament or from their uh, political groups. Um, also, and I, uh, what I noticed and what all of us noticed was that the Prime Minister Orban who always come to the European Parliament and he likes to speak in the plenary and slap us on the face. Uh, the Poland the Prime Minister, the Romanian Prime Minister was invited to answer on rule of law violation. The Maltese Prime Minister came to answer because we, we adopted the report saying that uh, Malta was a tax haven. Now they all use the same, uh, the same manipulation. You hit the Hungarian nation, you hit the Romanian nation, nation, you hit the Polish nation, you hit and you harm the Romanian nation. No, we don't hit the nations. We hit you, the government, and the bad law you adopt, and the bad measures you take. But when they do that, and they explain at home like this, look, the European Union is against you, they hit us, they harm us as a nation, many people believe so. So that's what they do in reality. And they all had the, the similar words in their speeches. Uh, well, in Romania, I'm happy that we had at least protest. We also have some in Poland uh, when they replaced the, the judges from Supreme Court. We had protests and even in 2017, in 2018, and in 2018 in August, we had uh, over 2,100 people in front of the government, including diaspora, and uh, they were uh, they were beaten up, uh, tear gas, uh, hand uh, grenades, and so on. But uh, what's important is what uh, the political leader said, and I will give you a few quota. quotas. Do not challenge us to come, one million, because we will smash you under our feet. That's from Romanian politicians running now the country. Another quota, men, women, or children, nobody is forgiven. On August 10th, only the strong ones shall live. Another quota, they should have been machine gunned, not just splashed with water. And the last quota, at least a bullet, a bullet in the heads of those so-called mothers who took their children to the protest. So this is the world we live in. These people who have never dared to make such statements before. Um, now, the EP now, has a majority uh, I was waiting for the minutes one minute uh, the policy of the EP now is quite uh, ambiguous I mean we want uh, we don't want uh, binding quotas anymore but uh, what we want is also leading to, to do all these uh, checks here. And uh, basically, more with all, all these more and more extremist and uh, nationalist and author, authoritarian and dictator, dictatorships uh, will not be able to, to do anything on this. So uh, I don't see a good future in this sense uh, for, for, uh, for the migration. And uh, for now, Orban and, uh, and uh, um, the Italian prime minister they are basically the de facto leaders of Europe. Orban, is, Orban keeps saying, I told you two years ago when I raised the fence, I told you two years ago that the migrants will hurt us. And people listen to him. That's why all these many parties, uh, you know, raised in other countries. And also because if people fear uh, migration, because that is a problem of the European Union, because it's a problem of the people. And the people don't even listen to arguments. Many of them, again, not all of them, don't even listen to arguments. 
it's here and they go like like you know like robots and uh, so the politicians adapt to this and uh, this is why uh, the extremist party raised uh, quite uh, quite uh, uh, high so i would finish by saying that uh, uh, the main characteristic of democracy is uh, its uh, fragility and uh, i'd like to quote um, from your colleague uh, David uh, David uh, Ziblatt from uh, democracies, how democracies die. Um, citizens are often uh, slow to realize that their democracy is being dismantled, even if it happens before their eyes. Now, I don't want to finish on this pessimistic tone. I'd like to say that we must fight, we must explain to people, we must argue, uh, we must convince the socialists uh, uh, who are also, who are only in favor of uh, migrants and uh, totally against anti-terrorist uh, anti, uh, uh, um, uh, terrorist measures, which is very debalanced, and people also need security. So we have also this fight in the parliament. So this all together are the, the picture of of why today we have extremists in Europe. Thank you. Thank you. And, and we have asked for air condition to be, you know, less cold. Uh, so good news, one good news too. Thank you. Thank you. I think I will remain seated. I don't have any slides and this may save a bit of time. So um, what we're talking about really is a transatlantic phenomenon, of course, and I think I am in some ways the personal embodiment of that uh, insofar as in the fall of 2016, I moved from Budapest uh, to Boston. And of course, uh, two months later, Donald Trump was elected president. And many of my friends wondered whether I was some kind of a political disease carrier. So um, I sit before you as a transatlantic phenomenon, and I thought maybe what I would do in the few minutes that I have here. Also served as Thunderstorm. Yeah, thank you. Well, I, let me say a word, by the way. This is one courageous woman right here. Uh, her role as the justice minister in Romania, Monica Macave, um, at a time when Corruption was rampant, and not that it isn't today, but it was, and no one was really paying much attention. She put herself on the line for that, so you need to know that. And of course, the, the man that you saw, <laughs> the man that you saw on the screen is my successor as the president of Central European University, another courageous person um, who I was very pleased and proud to be able to choose as my successor, along with the Board of Trustees of CU, and he's doing a remarkable job. So out there on the front lines of, of democracy in the new authoritarian era, there are some real heroes, and I think we need to recognize that. Um, so what, what I'd like to do is, is look at this uh, from a sort of pan-European, not really going to go to the US particularly, we've already had some discussion of that phenomenon, the phenomenon of nationalism and populism, and what are, what are some of its roots, and how have we gotten to this place. And then I want to look uh, briefly a little deeper into the laboratory of authoritarianism in Europe, which is, uh, at least in my experience, Hungary, um, which has had a, quite a remarkable uh, run at this, uh, in this game. So um, let's step back a minute and look very briefly at the two great forces that were unleashed by the end of the Cold War, which we know very well. It's the title of an afternoon um, panel, I believe, which are the forces of integration and the forces of disintegration. The forces of integration were really quite remarkable. They made great progress in the early days of cross-border trade and investment of course, NATO enlargement, uh, which we've discussed briefly this morning, German unification, uh, EU further integration, and the process of expanding the European Union into Central and Eastern Europe and the former uh, communist countries. 
Um, it was a really heady time, as we know, but they were equally powerful and often misunderstood at the time, forces of disintegration. Um, I had my own engagement with them in Yugoslavia, where I worked with Richard Holbrook uh, to try to assist in ending the war in Bosnia, the failed states and ethnic conflicts uh, that emerged that are, uh, in a way, exemplified in Europe by the Yugoslav collapse. Now, this, of course, in, over time led to another great force of disintegration, which Monica has talked about, which is the mass migration, um, uh, not only, of course, from Yugoslavia, that was a, a, a small piece, but uh, later on from the uh, failed states and, and catastrophic events of uh, uh, the Middle East and North Africa, uh, now leading to a mass migration of some 65 million refugees worldwide, obviously not all of them coming to Europe, but some of them coming to Europe. The terrorist attacks, the financial and Eurozone crises, the populist and nationalist reactions against the forces of integration, Brexit, Euroscepticism, we're familiar, of course, with this litany. And now, of course, in many ways, the future of the European Union itself, somewhat in doubt. So let's look a little deeper into the roots of this situation. We can see as you know, early as 2014, only four years ago, an overwhelming majority of Europeans across Europe in a poll conducted by the European Commission, 68% uh, said that they distrusted their elected governments and leaders. This is a dramatic increase from only 23% in 2002. And I think we have to be honest with ourselves that the elites of Europe, just as the case was true in the United States, were somewhat disconnected from uh, the these uh, growing areas of discontent as they promoted the forces of integration that I mentioned. Um, we know that an elite consensus effectively shaped the post-Cold War European policy in three critical areas, EU integration, multi-ethnic diversity, which became a, a, a rallying cry and a very important one for the European Union, and neoliberal economic reforms. Uh, which had, in many respects, a pretty devastating effect on the social welfare uh, opportunities for many Europeans. And this, this consensus at the, at the elite level was even given a name. It was called T-I-N-A. There is no alternative in English. You've probably seen that uh, captured. And it, it's kind of an amazing phenomenon that is as, as if it was, it, it's a little bit like uh, the end of history concept of the uh, of the post eighty nine period. There is no alternative to these forms of further integration and diversity and neoliberal economics. Now, the discontent with democracy that developed uh, and it developed simultaneously in the United States. So let me always look at that on the side as well. But it, I'm not talking about that. Um, was then triggered into a populist rebellion by the two. Uh, signal events of the 2009 period till today, 2008. First, of course, the financial crisis, uh, which had a devastating impact, particularly on Central and Eastern Europe, uh, where many people felt that they had gone back, in some respects, to the period in terms of their own well-being. Living standards uh, fell significantly. The migration crisis, which you, we've already talked about, of course, was the, the other big triggering events. And this led to three forms of populist rebellion. And again, this parallels to many extent what's happening in the US. Economic rebellion by people who felt left behind by the loss of jobs and the shutting down of some industries by the neoliberal austerity programs and cuts in social welfare that occurred. Uh, and the forces of globalization from which they saw the elites uh, disproportionately benefiting. And then you had the second uh, was a cultural rebellion by ethnic and national majorities who felt threatened by migration and by the new diversity standards that were uh, being carried by the European Union. And then you third had a security rebellion uh, by people whose fears of terrorism uh, 
seemingly justified after the many terrorist events that took place in the 2000s from 9-11 on, uh, and certainly many in Europe, and, the, and, and their fears of terrorism and crime morphed into a kind of xenophobia and racism and could easily then be manipulated by populist leaders uh, and nationalist politicians. Now, the leading laboratory for this and the earliest laboratory for this uh, populist nationalist movement and the authoritarianism in, in some ways that came out of this uh, was Hungary. And it is Hungary. Um, and the financial crisis certainly gave many Hungarians a sense that they were set back in their well-being, uh, especially in the rural areas where the majority of Hungarians live, as is the case in other parts of Eastern Europe, of course. But then you have to also understand this through the prism of Hungary's uh, long-standing sense of victim mentality, a long history of outside domination, uh, true also for other countries in Central Europe, the Turks, the Russians, the Germans, the Habsburgs, the Soviets, and also very specifically, in some ways, the UK and France, as well as the United States, which were seen to have uh, sold out Hungary in the First World War by essentially uh, divesting Hungary of many of its, uh, uh, you know, uh, Hungarians who were living in other parts of, uh, in elsewhere outside of, the, of Hungary because Hungary having been shrunk by the, by the so-called Trianon Treaty. So this all created a sense among normal Hungarians, people out in the countryside, uh, not members of the elite, long before Viktor Orban came along, that Brussels maybe was the new Moscow and that indeed uh, this is an other which we can't really understand. I think you saw some of the data that uh, Professor Eckert was showing in terms of support for the European Union. And so this all set the stage for uh, Viktor Orban, who is a remarkable uh, nationalist populist opportunist uh, who was able to fan the flames of this discontent by attacking outsiders as imagined oppressors, uh, certainly stimulating the feeling that the EU uh, was part of the outside uh, entity. The migrants, of course, the migration crisis ended up being one of his great populist uh, champion areas. And probably most terribly, and in some ways uh, indicating how far we've come in the resurrection, if that's not the right word here, but. Uh, of anti-Semitism in Europe is the attacks on George Soros, and George Soros becoming essentially the scapegoat uh, for Viktor Orban as he uh, pursued what he was doing. He, he defined this new regime, uh, which he said would promise to make Hungary great again, as a illiberal democracy, but in some ways I'm afraid it's more of a kind of Orwellian hypocrisy in the sense that um, he was using democratic elections to undermine democracy and to undermine the various institutions and checks and balances of democracy from the judiciary to the media. Um, and he was using EU funding to attack EU democratic values. 55% uh, of Hungary's uh, public works, uh, and there are many of them across Hungary, that is to say public investments, come from EU structural funds. So he's a recipient, and Hungary is a recipient of this remarkable amount of structural funding. And then, of course, attacking Hungarian universities and schools by controlling their curriculum, and international universities like CEU that really refuse to be controlled by, uh, in his case, using what I would call the tools of regulatory repression which Michael talked about very eloquent in his, in his remarks, that make it almost impossible for a CEU to operate in Hungary. Uh, not only attacking academic freedom, but actually attacking the rule of law by refusing to follow his own law on international universities with which CEU is in, in full compliance. Um, so, you know, that's the situation uh, that we have in terms of the development of this remarkable amount of authoritarian uh, governments in, in, in Hungary, which is reflected in some respects in 
Poland, as you've heard, and, and elsewhere in Central Europe. Now, the, the durability of Orban's authoritarianism need, needs to be underscored. He's been there now for eight years, re-elected twice, most recently with an even larger uh, percentage, although it's still a, less than a majority percentage of the vote, uh, through election laws that were uh, somehow manipulated in order to be able to uh, assure himself a continuing two-thirds majority in the parliament. Um, he's had a major influence on other nationalist and, and populist movements. And I think the two factors that have strengthened Orban's position, and here we do have a direct connection with the United States, are first the election of Donald Trump, uh, where Trump, uh, as you know, uh, reached out to Orban, and, and Orban was one of the first people to congratulate him on his election, and, uh, and, or and Trump is in some ways following the Orban playbook in the way he's operating in, in the United States. And then I think also the weakness of Angela Merkel uh, as a, an EU counterweight, uh, as a kind of a German EU counterweight was certainly the case. Now, let me just mention and then move toward closing, that I think there are vulnerabilities of this kind of authoritarianism. The biggest vulnerability, of course, is corruption. Um, and here I return to my tribute to Monica for what she did in the region to try to deal with corruption issues. You know, illiberal regimes like uh, Orban's breed oligarchies. That's certainly been the case in Hungary. They drain public assets. They destroy competition, uh, they stir up populist discontent, and they create big incentives for younger people and talented people to emigrate out of the country. And Hungary is losing um, four or 500,000 uh, people uh, over the last five years uh, for that uh, in, in the area of emigration. Um, and, you know, what we have remarkably is uh, some degree of civil society pushback against corruption. I think probably the, the best example is not from Hungary, but it's next door. I'd be interested to hear whether Monica agrees with this. 500,000 people in Romania earlier this year in various cities in Romania took to the streets to protest uh, the um, canceling or the, the, the proposed new law that would weaken anti-corruption penalties in Poland, uh, I mean in Romania, excuse me. Um, there have been similar protests in Hungary. Hungary has a tighter lid, so it's much more difficult, of course. Um, and there are also protests that occurred in Budapest when the Orban regime announced that it would plan to attack the internet, and 100,000 people came to the streets almost immediately uh, because everyone was using the internet, and actually the regime had to back down on that. So there are some examples. So let me conclude by asking where do we go from here, um, not just in Hungary and certainly not just in Europe, but actually in some ways across the transatlantic world. Um, you know, can the rise of illiberal regimes like the one in Hungary serve as a wake-up call to stimulate reform and rebuilding of liberal democracy in Europe? And I think three things would be needed uh, for that to occur. Uh, they're difficult things. First, I think political forces that are driving the democratic discontent, the populist movement that I've been speaking about, um, are real and in some ways legitimate, and they need to be addressed, particularly in the area of economic insecurity, the economic rebellion that I mentioned, through policies of economic inclusion. We don't see very much examples, and very many examples of that in the United States today, but. Um, economic inclusion that is, that is not regressive, tax issues and others that are not regressive. Uh, and coalitions need to be built across political divides um, that might be able to do that. For example, I think there's a, a, a fair amount of far left and far right agreement on, on economic uh, uh, inequality. Also, cultural insecurity, which is another major theme of the populist movement, needs to be addressed. And I think national identity and community need to be part of the, the system of liberal democracy just as much as diversity and civil rights. Then I think uh, the EU, of course, needs to step up its efforts to reform itself, 
Um, this is e far more easily said than done in the current political circumstances, but addressing the democracy deficit problem by opening up decision-making processes, engaging directly with national electorates, um, and then, as others have said, uh, dealing with the issue of border control is very important to preserve internal freedom of movement, manage the migration and asylum process. These are tall orders, but they obviously need to be addressed in order to to diminish the power of a populist reaction. And then the third and final thing that needs to happen, I think, is that uh, the EU needs to rebuild um, the tools for, um, uh, sharpen its tools for encouraging member states to adhere to democratic values and discipline those who don't. The informal dialogue method that's now used predominantly by the EU with errant member states like uh, like Hungary, has, is, is almost completely ineffective. The formal infringement procedure has been used, but is, is not uh, proving to be particularly effective. The so-called nuclear option, which would be the third way to go in this, would be to cut off or reduce EU funding to a member state that violates uh, EU laws and democratic values. Now, this could be effective in one way, but it also could stimulate more populist reaction in the country, I suppose, in another way. But it's something that ought to be looked at, and there ought to be a mechanism, as I think the EU is now considering, to be able to do this kind of uh, cutoff of funding. So let me conclude by just saying that I think the Authoritarian regimes have come to power in Europe by manipulating democratic discontent. This has also happened in the United States, although I think the authoritarianism is not anything like what we're talking about with Orban at this point. Um, but we've seen that these regimes can be vulnerable, particularly to corruption and oligarchy issues. And um, reform democratic institutions, if we're going to try to engage in reform, which we need to, uh, to reduce economic inequality and mediate the cultural issues that, that divide people um, are an important way to address this, this crisis. And I guess I would just finally close by saying that illiberal regimes and movements and authoritarianism can only lead in the end to a dead end, as I think the history of the 20th century uh, in Europe certainly dramatically demonstrates. So thank you very much. Um, thank you uh, to all our panelists. Uh, and we have, I have, I must admit, we have very limited time. We have 10 minutes. So this is what I hope to do. Uh, I will ask the first question, but before turning to our panelists, uh, I will turn to you and collect all the questions and then leave the final word to our panelists. Uh, so uh, as my role in my role as the chair, I, you know, uh, I see a theme in all of these, um, you know, uh, in the, all, you know, all of uh, all three speakers addressed, uh, you know, the issue of uh, uh, populism. Uh, I want to bring the attention to populism and the opposition. Uh, Zigors Ekiar talked about Hungarian opposition being in disarray. Uh, and also said, you know, opposition is being demonized in Poland, uh, and even referred to the emergence of even a more troubling historical bloc. Uh, Moniko Mukawei uh, referred to populism and nationalism in underlining the importance of migration, rightly so, uh, you know, as the biggest problem. Uh, you know, referred to populism and nationalism uh, as the main culprit, you know, behind the problems. And uh, so did, you know, John Shattuck referred to three forms of populist rebellion, uh, economic, cultural, and security. Now, when, you know, to address these issues, of course, there has to be a sound opposition, uh, you know. So if we can bring our attention to the opposition that is in disarray, apparently, uh, for a minute, uh, do you see any possibility of opposition using popul populism in a different way? Because, you know, populism in and of itself is not anti-democratic. You know, there are anti-democratic forces, there are populist forces, there are nativist forces, you know, that are against EU integration. 
So, um, is it you know? Is it, do you see any possibility of such a uh, change in the uh, perspective of the opposition? Uh, that would be my question. So, uh, but now I would like to turn to uh, yes. Uh, please go ahead. Yeah, Vivian Schmidt. Um, thank you all for such wonderful talks uh, and for such wonderfully depressing pictures. Uh, um, of all of this. So what I'd like to do is just ask you a very simple question and with no simple answers. How do we get beyond this? I mean, John began to give us some issues, but it seems to me that much of this was focused on the national level rather than the EU level. So I'd like to ask you about the EU. Can the EU continue with authoritarian states in its midst? In its midst? I mean, what happens to the EU if they don't manage to to deal with this? Um, and what measures can the EU bring to bear to counter all of this? We've already heard that it's very weak and pathetic. Um, but on economic inclusion, would that mean, what could the EU do to promote this? What about economic neoliberalism? What does the EU, how does the EU change on this? Um, but how does the EU deal with this upsurge of national identity uh, issues, uh, which are not just in the authoritarian movement, but everywhere. You know, how does the EU counter that when the very existence of the EU actually promotes the sort of kind of counter um, cultural identity stuff? Okay. Uh, Dimitris Sotiropoulos, thank you for this wonderful panel. I think there is a dilemma in what um, the international community could do to deal with the problems which were so eloquently presented to us. On the one hand, one would say that we have to manage the problems which the populists themselves have created, such as violation of rule of law, uh, discriminatory behavior against migrants, and so on and so forth. On the other hand, it seems to me that this would not be enough because um, one would have to think which were the original failures of the political regimes and national economies in place before the populists arrived in power. And you have um, indeed mentioned all these, corruption, uneven living standards, um, the problem of failing European integration, and so on and so forth. So my question would be, um, if before the populists came to power, there were all these different problems of democracy, European integration, corruption, which of those should be first be dealt with so that no new populists would be able to count on such failures in order to win power again in the future? One last question. Uh, saying, oh, uh, referring to the fellow, um, the courage. Uh, the question would be about uh, Russia's role. Uh, Ms. McAvey uh, mentioned about it um, a little bit. Um, uh, the, Russian factor in Europe, I think, as much as I can observe, is growing in terms of their meddling into uh, uh, party lives in, in the countries and uh, feeding certain parties, selected parties, with Russian funding uh, in a way to uh, emphasize differences uh, in, in, in the countries, target countries. Um, I, I, the question would be how um, uh, speakers uh, would, uh, would uh, respond uh, to uh, the Russian factor in changing and affecting uh, the, uh, the flow of authoritarianism in, in the EU. Okay, so can we take this now, maybe the reverse order, starting with John Shattuck and Monica McCoy and Whichever question you'd like to answer, that's how we do. <laughs> well, I, I will relate several of the questions. I think it's a real, real dilemma, if you will, is what to do about populism. What is populism? Is it, does one need to establish an opposition to populism mm -hmm. in order to save democracy? Or indeed, is it possible to look at populism as a, uh, a way to refresh and uh, restore democracy? Um, now, historically, uh, there have been some pretty good examples of populism that, that restored sure. democracy. In the United States in particular, uh, the populist movement of the late uh, 19th century uh, 
uh, stimulated the progressive movement that brought about a fair amount of uh, social and economic change in the United States in the early 20th century before the First World War. Um, there are plenty of uh, examples of exclusive populism that are very dangerous, and obviously I, the, the ones that are most dangerous are the ones that turn to fascism. Um, but I think we, we need to look at populism as an potentially, potentially an inclusive phenomenon, uh, which, and this gets to the point that I was making in my remarks about the possibility of bringing together the left and the right to address uh, economic uh, inequality issues. And I think there's a real potential for that. I've felt uh, here in the United States that the, those voters who supported Bernie Sanders in uh, the 2016 presidential elections actually had some, some of them, something in common with some of the voters for Donald Trump. And a, a an astute political movement that could put these two areas together would actually use populism to refresh democracy, particularly in the area of economic uh, inequality. So I, I think several of the questions raised that theme, and that's my answer. Well, <clears throat> I'll start with the last question. Um, Yes, the Russians' propaganda is all over Europe, not only over Europe. Uh, <clears throat> and Russians uh, don't think in uh, days or months or years. They think in hundreds of years, mm -hmm. which is different from Europe, at least. Um, and actually, Putin said at uh, two NATO summits very clearly and publicly that he wants to take back under his control the, pre the former uh, Soviet <coughs> countries, and that's what he does. Now we have uh, very, so but now the propaganda, Russian propaganda is very sophisticated. It's not saying Russia is good and EU is bad. You know, people don't realize it. People who don't know don't believe it. But it's everywhere, in the Czech Republic, Hungary, in, uh, for, uh, in, in the Western countries as well. Uh, now what EU is doing, is doing very little. We have a, a unit uh, with the External Action Service, uh, which is called uh, East Stratcom, uh, which has about, uh, from it increases uh, under our pushing from uh, four to nine people working on this, uh, but they also work on candidate countries like uh, the Republic of Moldova or uh, Serbia. Serbia is all uh, taken by Russian in Montenegro we have all uh, Russians oligarchs, uh, still there are uh, um, EU <laughs> candidates. So uh, yes, we have some people uh, trying to counterbalance it. So we are aware of this, but uh, the external action service, which is a kind of ministry of uh, foreign affairs of, of uh, Europe, uh, is doing very little on this. And it's true that the leader is, uh, is a socialist. Um, I'd also like to 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 answer um, uh, <coughs> about the populist. It's not about. I wouldn't say it's about identity of people because identity is preserved. We gave a part of our sovereignty on some on some decisions, but identity of each nation in the European Union is preserved. Is pre preserved. It's uh, the old uh, formula, uh, which is still actual uh, 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 unity in diversity, yes? No one is asking any country to give up uh, customs, you know, different uh, ways of life and so on. Uh, now with the funds, with the European funds, I tell you something. Uh, uh, many leaders want to leave you, uh, even if they lose European funds, uh, because they prefer to use the European, the national budgets and uh, borrow money because European funds comes with rules and controls and prison and confiscation of money. Uh, and uh, I don't say it's a rule, but for Hungary or Poland or uh, Romania, for instance, and others, 
uh, yes, they want. Um, now I explain what's the problem uh, of, uh, I said what's the main problem now. Uh, all Europe talks about migration. I remember when Salvini was elected in Italy this year, uh, Angela Merkel made a uh, call for an informal summit in Brussels immediately. Now Orban and Salvini tweeted very rudely, very, very rude, uh, that they don't come and they are the next future uh, leaders of Europe and they don't bother to come to, to meet her. Um, Thank I, you. I think I cannot answer any more. Thank you. Well, let me just make a couple of points uh, uh, which relate to you know, what, what John said, but also to some of your questions, John. Now, first of all, I think that um, we are making a, a very big mistake uh, thinking about this EU liberal elites uh, which hijack uh, each European <coughs> country. Uh, I think this is, this is popular, of course, uh, in interpretations uh, here, but also within those countries. So members of those elites are taking the blame and, and, and you know, they deserve blame themselves from um, you know, all the things they've done producing this wave of, of populism. So, so, so first of all, I think you know, those countries, thanks to liberal elites, made tremendous progress. Uh, look at Russia, look at Ukraine, look at other places where there were no liberal elites, uh, where those countries are today. So that's number one. Uh, number two, this was not imposed liberalism by elites. It was the emergence of consensus which was cutting across, you know, elite mass <laughs> division. Uh, trade union workers in Poland believe that the only way to achieve anything is to privatize their enterprises, mm -hmm. right? So, so this was not a product of elite imagination. This was sort of a commonly shared set of ideas across different groups, different regions in all those countries. Uh, so that's, that's the point uh, number one. Uh, now the point number two is about uh, explaining populism. How do we explain why this happens and so on? And I think again, we are making this simplistic assumption that this is about economics. So if we come up with better you know, welfare policies, uh, everything will be solved. No, this is not true. I mean, you know, if, if you look what kind of welfare policies Poland has, there is no other country in Europe with this generous welfare state you see in Poland. So adding, you know, another 500 zlotys for, you know, uh, people uh, earning below a uh, certain level doesn't change much, right? So, you know, populism is a very complex cultural phenomenon and, and, and there is no simple economic solution uh, to it. And then the final point uh, is, is about EU. Um, I think that EU cannot function with authoritarian countries within. Um, it cannot do it, first of all, for, uh, let's say, moral reasons, because you know one of the last remaining legitimation for the European Union is that there is this set of values which are shared by all Europeans. We now know that this is not the most efficient economic system, uh, that it has a bunch of other institutional problems of various kinds, uh, but the values shared by everyone uh, are the really the last remaining legitimizing uh, device. So that's, that's from the moral point of view, but from the very pragmatic, the realist point of view, uh, what Orban and Kaczynski will do to the European Union is to paralyze the decision-making process, right? The, you know, the EU operates on consensus and, and, and sort of, you know, uh, good behavior of all the people involved in this decision-making process. When they start blocking and they can do it, right? Almost in all dimensions, then we are in trouble, right? So either you think about this from the moral point of view, you should really uh, 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 reject the efforts to build authoritarian rule within the EU, or whether you do it from pragmatic reasons, uh, um, you should reject that. So, uh, and the last point I want to make uh, uh, is this. We spent the last three years 
debating the sources of populism. All the conferences, all the panels, where does it come from, you know, how this happened, and so on. We spent zero attention to the issue how populism ends. Right? So, what do we do? What are the historical examples of the end of populism? <laughs> you know, we know what happened to fascism in Italy. We know what happened to uh, many other things. You have places like Argentina, which populism become endemic, and you have one crisis cycle after another for the last how many, 60 years, and so on. But are there any other ways in which populism ends without war or without going into a permanent cycle of, of crisis situations? That's a very good question, and I think we should spend more time trying to figure that out. Uh, I think the polarization you see in East Europe, West and East, polarization you see in the United States has such an extent that it's really very difficult to imagine how those people can start talking to one another, right? How, you know, those people who are treated as traitors, murderers, and thieves should have a serious conversation with people who call them that way, right? So, so that's the challenge, how you try to bridge that polarization which was built up by, uh, by those populist movements. Okay, on this note, this is a good note to end, I think. Uh, join me thanking our panelists. Thank you.